Okay. Oh, awesome. Uh, so it's me again, uh, Hong Jian Fan. And uh, um, uh, for this session, I'm going to talk about the shared memory and the pooled memory. Um, okay, let's move to the page. Uh, okay. Uh, so there are some uh, really informal definitions about the two models. First thing I need to uh, make clarification is uh, this is talking about uh, uh, a scenario that we use uh, memory appliances. Um, basically, uh, several servers uh, connect to the same memory appliances and uh, each server can request or use the memory on the appliance. So basically the overall uh, goal is to um, share the memory, improve the utilization, and uh, reduce the uh, overall cost um, so that uh, each server doesn't have to um, install huge amount of uh, memory what it can target uh, like uh, at its average use utilization and uh, uh, in a short period of time uh, when it needs a amount of uh, memory you can ask uh, that temporary memory from the memory appliance um, so the difference, major difference between a pulled memory model and a shared memory model is if that memory is uh, exclusive. A pulled memory, it will have uh, its uh, uh, own memory. It's uh, not going to be shared with any other thing. So once it's claimed or requested that memory, it's all theirs. Um, but for shared memory, you will have uh, the same size of memory as other servers connected to the same appliance. When you use this the memory, you can allocate, but um, the memory could be used by some other servers. So uh, when an application tries to allocate memory, um, it might not allocate all the memories from the memory space. Um, so let me show some uh, uh, illustration. Uh, so on the left is the pulled memory. Um, so basically, um, um, I'm showing the uh, DRAM as one human node or whatever, one space range and the CXL memory is as a, another um, human node or space range. And uh, it looks exactly like its own memory. Um, but if it feels it needs more memory uh, at some time, it send a request to the memory appliance. And uh, um, the memory appliance will give it more memory. So it feels like a, a physically hot plug-in an extra piece of DRAM or whatever. Uh, or a CXL memory, uh, but it feels like a hot plugin. And once it's finished with that piece of memory, it says, okay, I don't need it. I can give it back. It's a, a hot unplug. Um, but for the shared memory, um, you will be aware of it, uh, at least um, what I understand, um, the memory management side will understand that's a huge piece of memory. I can use it and some other servers um, can use it as well. So I have a whole piece of uh, memory, but some of it is unusable. So this is a uh, kind of a basic uh, concept of the uh, old memory and shared memory. Uh, I, um, it's still in the concept phase and uh, um, I hope to get some uh, um, uh, script and uh, uh, models set up maybe in the next couple months, hopefully. Uh, so here are some thinkings from myself and I would like to get your opinions as well. Uh, so for the um, model, um, the really um, the key requirement or the feature uh, that needed is the mechanism of a uh, hot expansion and shrinking. Uh, like to get that memory to be added and uh, uh, removed uh, uh, freely or at least uh, um, um, feasible and uh, uh, within uh, acceptable time um, limit. And uh, the other thing I think for this to be working, there needs to be a device driver or some kind of a, a host service that monitors uh, the system uh, saying, okay, I want to always keep like at least one gigabyte of free memory on my server. Uh, once the applications use a lot, the free memory is less than amount I will request and get more memory from the appliance. Um, and for the shared memory system, uh, one thing I was thinking about is uh, um, uh, how the system will be able to know which memory is available, which is not, and what kind of level of granularity 
do we need to make it uh, to a single page level or we can just uh, keep on a larger size say currently there is a, um, a structure um, under this route I can online offline an existing memory is this could be a good uh, start point for this kind of uh, mechanism uh, so that's uh, uh, one thing and uh, the other challenge for this is uh, several different servers will be able to access the same memory, but we need to let them know which piece of the memory is not usable. Uh, so it's uh, hard to, uh, at least uh, there are some thinkings about, should we um, put a mechanism that uh, each server will keep a copy of used memory uh, so that each of the server will say, okay, I know where it has been used and uh, uh, when I want to allocate, I know the rest are available. And uh, uh, the other thinking is uh, let the memory appliance to keep the usage. Every time the, the host server wants to use some new memory, you will ask the memory appliance, uh, show me some places it's usable. Uh, so the first way will have a lot of communications, data traffic between each servers. Uh, and the second one will um, generate a lot of traffic and maybe some delays. Uh, can I, maybe ask, can I maybe ask a basic question about this for mm -hmm. the shared memory systems? Um, it sounds like you're saying you'd like the memory to be managed here just like normal RAM is today. Um, yeah. Are you sure about that? Um, I've always assumed that things where the memory can kind of be written by some other entity, you know, we have to have that be really special because it's essentially, for instance, like not cache coherent, right? We have to make sure that, um, you know, if, uh, if somebody else is using that memory that we don't have any dirty cache lines to that memory. And it's, it's, of course, possible to write software that has this coordination in place, but like nothing in the kernel understands that that's how this memory could work. Um, so we couldn't, for instance, like ever have a kernel data structure in shared, in shared memory. So that to me says that it, it can't really be, um, you know, online as normal old memory, right? Um, were you thinking something different? Uh, the idea is that uh, you will be pretty much similar to the system memory. So you will keep all the cache coherency and uh, um, all of this is uh, based on the CXL protocol. Well, but I'm saying it's fundamentally not cache coherent, right? Because um, if I've cached some data in my CPU caches, there's nothing to say that that memory that I've cached, you know, the backing memory won't change underneath what I have in my CPU caches. And that's fundamental to having shared memory, right? Because something else across the TXL bus, some other system that's sharing it can go right to that. And so all of a sudden the data I have in my cache doesn't match the data I have in, in memory. And again, you can write software that, that understands this and can and configure this out, but I'm saying the kernel isn't that software. And most, you know, most things that call malloc, you know, aren't that software. So how do we reconcile that? Yes. Oh, okay. So um, I might, okay. So, let me make sure I understand correctly. So this shared is just because all the servers share the same memory space. It's not meaning they can access to the same piece of memory. Then if server A allocate the memory uh, from a shared memory pool, by the time um, server B can no longer access to that memory. Oh, so it's not truly shared between two systems. It really is private to the system, but it's like physically in the same place yeah, and the same, the same like- uh, It's the same physical um, memory space, same physical range. But once a piece of memory has been allocated, the other servers on the server level uh, is not allowed to access to that. And we need to decide uh, where we are to uh, stop other uh, servers to access to it. it so, uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here because like what I've been hearing here is nothing new. In the virtualized world, we have both. Like the first thing is essentially just ballooning or virtual mem, which, which resizes memory. The second thing, interestingly, you find on L powers, like on IBM C system, standby memory, where you can try onlining memory if it's available in the hypervisor. If, if it's currently used by somebody else, you cannot online it. So it's essentially the, the same thing just now in hardware, which, which scares me a bit because like, I'm not sure if we should be doing that, but you might have your reasons. We, we, we might find use cases. What I'm trying to say is that like, like we're fighting in the virtualized world with all of that. 
Um, so you're going to have to fight a lot in the physical world as well. And <laughs> you, can, you can contact me, it, it, like uh, David Hildenbrand, and I can tell you all of the details about like what, for example, power the LPAR does, uh, what IBM C system with standby memory does, like how different ballooning devices work, stuff like that. But, but in summary, this, this is really not something new and some of the problems were already solved. Like for example, an IBM C system with standby memory, they abuse, for example, LSM and change mem these commands to, uh, to add or remove more memory. And like if the hypervisor is allowed to give them more. So, um, so yeah, it might be good yeah. to explore what others have been doing already and like what are the limitations. Because like whenever we talk about removing memory, it's like it's mostly pure luck if it works or not. And mm -hmm. that's got not going to yes. change just because we call it CXL, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. It, it, it imposes even more problems, I would say. Okay. Yeah, sounds like we are trying to bring a, a, a problem that between the hypervisor and the virtual machines into a server to uh, appliances level. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's why uh, I'm showing uh, two models and uh, I'm not saying one model is better or the other. And it, basically just some ideas and I would like to uh, get uh, some experiments with. But as you mentioned, it's an existing problem that will give me a lot of uh, um, like uh, learning. Um, so this is really good. Uh, um, any other questions or comments so far? So I'm, I'm curious as to what you think the, the benefit of the shared memory system, you, you seem to be wanting to you know, it's it's all physically visible from everywhere, but but you're still going to try to exclusively use it in one place or another. So, yeah, it, it is versus the pooled memory system. Are you thinking that that is going to be more dynamic with less work than than sort of the pooled view of things? Yes, uh, it really depends on. Um, so the pooled model, I think the key point is how do we fast and reliably uh, doing hot plugging and removal. And for shared memory, we need to communicate like um, where it's useful, where it's not. This is the key difference. Okay, and, but, and for the shared memory, you are not expecting hardware coherency between all those, all those machines. If if I stop using it, my responsibility is to make sure that it was fully flushed, and right. and nothing exists in the hardware before someone else can start using it. Is that correct? I think that's the point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. It, where in the system are you going to provide those guarantees, though? I, I'm I'm curious in in your model here, um, when you have that sharing. Um, where is the access to that memory cut off after the system is done using it, for instance? Yeah, that's, uh, I do not have an answer to that, sorry. I need to, I really need to think about more details, um, but yeah, I don't have that answer yet. I could think about maybe some communications between the host and the appliance, like say, if, do, if, a piece of memory is to going to be removed. We need that host node to flash all the cache content back to the memory. No, I mean all the um, that all the data on the um, that piece of uh, memory has to be like a deal allocated, and uh, so basically it means there's no valuable information on it. But. Yeah, yeah, Dave. As, as far as I understand, that level of uh, of of where the cutoff is, where, where it's unmapped from the, uh, from the host is outside of the kernel's visibility. Uh, so, I mean, so, so the, the device knows what it's de decoding, but if uh, somebody behind the device is, un is physically taking away extents from, from your mapping, um, that there's the interface for the kernel to, to acknowledge that. But in terms of like, could the kernel control it or make sure that nobody else is accessing it? Yeah, it's, it kind of, it's kind of a trust the, uh, Trust the switch, the, trust the thing behind the device kind of situation. But uh, yeah, I was, I was gonna say, to, I was gonna say to, to to David's David's point. Yeah, I think I think people are, go, are people are gonna want. Um, there's this conflict between people want their 
normal memory allocation, NUMA APIs, they want online memory because that's what their applications are written to. And then there's also people that they, they simultaneously want um, uh, hard guarantees about removing memory. And those two things are in conflict. And so, like, like you were saying yesterday, Dave, like, like I think we need, either need to reset people's expectations that no, you can't remove everything all the time, but you can probably move some of it most, like <laughs> you can remove some of it most of the time, but, but not all of it all the time. Um, um, re either reset those expectations or teach people how to keep their, or, 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 or change applications to make sure that they uh, don't let um, memory get into places where they can't get it back out again. But this is gonna, I think it's gonna be a learning, a learning experience for the industry. Yeah, it will, uh, it will kind of expand the places where people get to see memory hot plug. And like David mentioned, you know, there are, there are places where it's used a little more widely today, like in VMs, but this will widen the number of people that are exposed to it. So I think that's the other um, the thing I really want people to look at here is how is this different from memory hot plug? And, and I don't think that it is. And, you know, what are the limitations that we have in the kernel today on memory hot plug? And there are, you know, quite a few. Yeah, it, it's, add, it's adding a level behind memory hot plug that wasn't there before, which is like memory hot plug is kind of like the last the last mile of, of of instantiating new physical address space. But then there's there's a management of the physical address space behind that before it gets to the memory hot plug that Linux never had to do before. Like it's 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 the thing that it's the thing that all our platform firmers did for us. Like we, they they mapped they mapped DDR for us and this told us an address range. But now Linux is involved in managing the address range before the fact, and then saying, "Okay, this address range actually has populated memory now. Now go do the memory hot plug thing." So it's kind of a there's it's that new layer of physical address management. Yeah, but yeah, th this this is an act an active area of the uh, of the uh, CXL specification working group to figure out all these details. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Uh, yes, so it sounds like CXL um, community needs some uh, further work on this topic. Uh, okay, uh, let me just uh, uh, to cover the rest of the uh, this page. Uh, so uh, for shared memory system, um, I think it's probably also need some uh, uh, kind of uh, a warning or a mechanism to show the system how much real available uh, memory is. Um, but if the system is keeping its own um, kind of tracking of used memory, it might not be that critical for this. Uh, the other question or the other thinking is uh, within the memory being shared uh, between different servers, um, is that possible? or real make any practical use to uh, to add some um, kind of a wait period if the memory is not enough just to wait for other servers or other threads to release some memory before like terminate the thread. And the uh, uh, last thing I was thinking about uh, saying the appliance has been run for a long time enough and the, the fragmentations uh, might cause some usage like um, a waste of the memory. So is that uh, another um, place to consider? It, it, so, two comments um, from me um, regarding out of memory handler. Whenever I read that, I get scared because people think that they can intercept out of memory handler and just like get the system back alive by waiting long enough. But that's not true because you can have other allocations already failing and messing up your system. That's uh, that's actually like uh, one thing I've been d discussing lately with some bro balloon related work with, again, auto ballooning, which I detest, uh, where they like wanted to intercept and out of memory handle and then just tell the system, oh yeah, let's wait for like more memory to get back to us. But that doesn't work usually because you could have some other allocations already failing and messing up the system. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that this is like a really important topic to work on. Um, like how could you actually tell the system that you're currently short of memory and wait in a, in a safe way? And the out of memory killer, for example, intercepting in that is usually not what you want to do. Um, and uh, the other point you raised with memory defragmentation, I mean, like we have to do a lot better, like 
work on that. I mean, we have all of these transparent huge page cases, like we want to allocate, like, like everybody nowadays wants to allocate like larger chunks of memory, and that doesn't really reflect the reality in the system. That's also relevant when you want to remove memory from the system in bigger granularity than just base pages. So um, like, I think like the last two points are the most important work you have to look into to make all of the other above work somewhat reliably. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other suggestions? Yeah, just to kind of pile on the OOM issue. Um, yeah, don't forget that, like, if you were waiting for this appliance to give you some more memory, um, that involves memory hot add, right? And memory hot add requires allocating memory, which is hard when you're already out. So, again, there are pools and ways to do these things up front, but it, it is it is a very hard problem just to say oh we can wait for them to give us more physical address space because it's a there's a lot of work and that's on a much different time scale than than the handler works so um, yeah I I can't imagine this being applied to you know actually stop something that's zoomed you're going to have to do it way before you hit the U handler like I I talk about the U handlers being something like an airbag in a car yeah it's a safety mechanism but it's kind of a last resort like it is not something you ever want to do like in um, it, it's uh, something you never want to have to resort to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I never thought that this that this could be re reactionary. I always thought it had to be like you're scheduling jobs, and you, you know this job at this time of day needs a whole bunch of memory, but every other time of day it doesn't. So you temporarily add proactively, and then you try to get it back um, after the fact. But yeah, I, I don't think we can have reaction. We can't have like the kernel memory pressure. Talking to data, talking to data center controllers to add more memory. I think that's that's too late. It has to be proactive, at least at least in the in the beginning. Yeah, it sounds like adding memory is always easier than removing it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this sounds. Yeah, this is really good. I think. Oh, yeah. Get a lot of information from you guys and this. Uh, um, um, all I want to cover, and uh, uh, thank you. I think uh, we are one minute early to finish this section. Thank you. Thank you.